Brandon Marshall and Peter King stop by to break down a wild Thursday night of football. And don't look now, people. Finally, Watson, I could cheer, cheer for in the NFL, too, actually. We start now. Last night was an absolute battle. This is the rivalry I needed in the NFL. Always close games, always down to the wire. Herbert, Mahomes, of course, the Chiefs pull it out to a 27-24 to victory. I was hoping for overtime, but then I kind of wasn't because Herbert was dealing with rib injuries and all sorts of stuff. The latest is that he's going to go under a battery of tests today, and we'll get you all of that information. we got to break this game down, and to do so, a very special guest. Tell me what you know about me. If I said it, then I'm in it, and then what it's gon' be. I see everything that I want in my reach. Ain't a game I ain't playing. If I am, it's for keeps. I'm too heavy, too heavy, too heavy, too. Jets, Broncos, but I miss yeah. the Bears days. Why this year with 13 <laughs> seasons in the NFL, and you were the first player, Brandon Marshall, in NFL history to have a thousand yards receiving in a season for four different, or yeah, for four different teams. That means you had success no matter who was throwing you the ball, wherever you were. That was all you. So we welcome uh, you as an athlete and also the creator of I Am Athlete, which is not a podcast; it is a media empire. How are you? I'm great. Um, yeah, that, that was special being able to play on a few different teams, having 17 plus quarterbacks and having success. It's similar to your, your broadcasting career, your media career. No matter where you go, what network you're on, you're going to be special and you're going to have a lot of success. So congratulations to you on joining the FanDuel team. Thanks, B Marsh. And I How does it we, feel? How does that feel? It feels good to be doing look. something by myself, right? To have like the leeway to say, okay, I'll take a little bit of a risk and I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And FanDuel is really supportive of that, and I'm really grateful for the real estate, you know? You did it all network? you. Can we curse on y'all network? I don't know. Can we? Let's ask the control room. They're saying no. It's on cable, so I don't think so. Okay, all right. But if you do, right, I won't be mad at you, ever. <laughs> all right, let's get to this right now. Everybody's talking about the play of the game, and what a story, right? Jalen Watson pick six. There's nothing to say about this. It was beautiful. The bigger story is what happened with tight end Gerald Everett, okay? Herbert targeted him there on that interception. The play before, he asked to come out of the game. He's clearly gassed, B. Marsh. How much of what right. happened is on Everett? 100% on Everett, right? Like, this is what conditioning is for. I've been in this position before where you get down to the red zone, you're, you're tired, you're exhausted. Something else has to kick in for you to stay on the field and get the job done. When it's red zone and it's third down, your top guys need to find a way to stay on the field. And if you're tired and you're on the field in these critical moments, you, you got to do your job. In, in this instance, he did not do his job. Why? Because when you run routes like this, where you can have a, 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 an option to keep going or sit down, you have to be decisive. The quarterback is reading you. We work on this every single day in pre in pre practice, right? Shallow crosses. If you're looking, you're booking. If you're not looking, that means you're stopping. So the quarterback is expecting you to be a certain place, and he's right. going to throw the ball. This is 100% on the tight end. I, I see what you're saying. I, so I had a thought, and I want to know your thought on this. And I was going to ask you, if is it on the coaching staff? Should the coaching staff have taken him out? Because that's something that I'm seeing a lot on Twitter. But also, I guess the question is, does a veteran quarterback make this decision and throw to Everett when he's clearly not 100%? Or does he recognize that because of experience as a player? Uh, or does he look somewhere else in his read, right? Does he go to the other side of the field? Yeah. Like, I'm not putting it on Justin Herbert, but we all forget that this is a young QB. He's still growing. He's still developing. Does a Tom Brady, you know, make that sort of situation happen? So let me tell you what Tom Brady, my guys like Jay Cutler, I had a little cup yeah. of tea with Eli Manning, Russell Wilson, <laughs> some of those guys. But those type of quarterbacks, even Tom Brady, like you mentioned, you know what Tom Brady's going to say? Hey, Gronk, get your butt back in yeah. the game. He's not going to let your, he's not going to let his tight end, his star tight end, leave the field on a third down situation or red zone. So in those moments, I'm telling you, you if you're on the field, you have to do your job. So I've been in that situation before where I'm tired, but the reason why you stay on the field because that's where you make your money, okay? Third down, we got to win third down. We have to we have to have red zone efficiency through the roof if we want to be competitive in the league. So this is 100% on Everett, but I understand. I've made this mistake before, 
but he just has to learn from it and get better. And then you have Herbert himself who's out there. It's not like he's mailing it in at the end of this game, right? They're down 10. He's out. The coaching Warrior. staff isn't pulling. Warrior, totally. And the, the injury is a huge story here. We're looking for updates. But he gutted it out. He clearly had something going on with his rib. What did you make of his performance? And what does that do in the locker room? Listen, Herbert, is the he's the real deal. But I was going to crush Herbert until I saw that he was dealing with something, whether it's chest, ribs, whatever the situation is. Um, I was going to crush him because now he's sitting here at, what, 17 and 19 or, or 16 and 18 overall record through the mm -hmm. first three years, two and a half, two and a quarter uh, 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 of, his, of his career. Like, that's not good enough. But we want to crush some of these other quarterbacks that come in and have success and win. At the end of the day, it's about winning, and that's it. And Herbert, special talent, but then you got to make sure you get that W at the end of the day. But for him to go out there and gut it out, throw that touchdown, I was like, you know what? Let me let me ease off of that. Let me ease off of that point. Maybe week five, week six, I'm having that discussion. Hopefully not, because I think they have everything they need to be a contender this year. Uh, should the Chargers have pulled him out? I mean, they're down 10. He's getting hit by Frank Clark. He's got George Karloftis all over him. Like, what, what, should, what should the coaching staff have done? I was saying get him out of the game. Yeah, I was saying the same thing when I saw it. I was like, you know what? Um, you know, it's a long season because, I mean, w warming up, you can see his face. You can see how painful yeah. it was for him and how much pain he was in. So I was like, you know what? You protect your quarterback there. He's a type of guy. He doesn't talk. He doesn't talk to you. He doesn't talk to me. He doesn't talk to the media. He doesn't talk to half his damn teammates. This is a dude that's just going to go out there and be where he's supposed to be, no matter what the situation is. So I respect him for that. But when you have a, 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 a special talent like that, you have to protect him. I think Chiefs fans are probably real pissed at me because I'm not even talking about them. And Mahomes looked good again. And it's no Tyree kill, no problem, right? The depth in this Chiefs receiving core makes them really scary. And they're shining. He hit nine different guys again. Eight guys had two or more catches. Is it better for him to have that one go-to star or have the depth? Is this sustainable for the Chiefs? It is sustainable for the Chiefs, but look, let's not get it twisted, Kay. Like, you, you, you want guys that can, you know, do some legendary things in big moments. That's Tyreek Tyre Hill, okay? What you want is to have those stars like the Tyree Kills of the world uh, that can fit within your offense. I had to learn that early mm. in my career. Back when I was young, the first four years, I wanted the ball every single play. And then as I got older and I matured, I realized that the – we would be more efficient as an offense if Alshon Jeffrey got the ball, if Martellus got the ball, if Matt Forte got his 20 cut t touches, because now they can't just single me out and double me, right? So it's actually better for the star receiver when the other guys are getting involved. I go back to my Denver days with Eddie Roy. Eddie Roy had 91 catches. I had 104 catches. He had Brandon Stokely and Tony Scheffler yeah. that had 50 catches. And then you go to the Jets, my, my boy Eric Decker. Eric Decker had 90 catches, uh, 12 touchdowns, a legendary year. And I had a, a all-pro year. So you want to spread the wealth. And it's working for them. And they're really scary in that AFC right now. They're looking good. And credit to Spags for getting this defense to make plays, especially down the Spags. stretch in the fourth quarter. Short week. I know they were at home. But for them to have even just the power to do what they did, they always, Spags always has coaches them up right at the moment, at least he does uh, out there in Kansas City. All right, yes, let's talk does. about I Am Athlete because there is so mm -hmm. much going on. I feel like I can't even keep track of it all. You have like 90 Instagram handles. You're booking so many stars. <laughs> I saw the Michael Strahan episode. Uh, you say it's not a podcast. You say it's a movement. Can you tell me the right. goal of your movement? It's you. You're doing it. I mean, you left the, uh, you know, linear television. Well, I mean, you're still on linear television, but what FanDuel is doing is disruptive, right? FanDuel is leading the way in this space, right? Like it's the premier destination when it comes to sports betting and sports content. Woo! You chose to leave where you're at and come to FanDuel. That is new media. You are new media. We're doing things our way. Look how you're dressed. Look at your set. We don't see that, you know, <laughs> on, on traditional uh, television, right? Like we're the ones that are able to get these guys. So this movement is exactly what you're doing. It's what I'm doing. It's Pat McAfee. Like yeah. this is new media. Pat, you and Pat, I mean, I, I love. Don't stop yeah. saying, stop, stop, and stop me too. saying All of us, me and family. Pat. Thank you. Love okay, it. thank you. Uh, okay, well, I just <laughs> right. love, you know, players come and they talk to you and it's very, uh, you were this, here's how I'm going to say this. The first time I ever heard an NFL player talking about mental health, it was you. 
you and, and I'm obviously a Bears fan, and it just caught me. You know, just I followed your career. You're you know, a prolific wide receiver, one of my favorites. I don't think there's anybody like you in the in the league on the right now on the field. But off of it, you really trailblazed in that way. Can you sort of? assess for me the progress that's been made specifically in the NFL in that area. Are you impressed? Do you think that there's a ways to go when it comes to how the league and teams support their players in that way? Listen, there's always work to be done, right, for sure. But I'm super impressed and super proud of the NFL, the league office, for the work that they're doing. Tracy Perlman mm -hmm. in the league office, she calls me almost every other week with different opportunities or even just bringing me into the discussion. Brandon, what do you think about this? Are we looking at this the right way? How do we activate some of these partnerships? How do we get our teams to do more? I mean, when I did, when I came out uh, in 2011, August 4th, 2011, I told the world, you know, what I was experiencing, what I've gone through, and what I want to do moving forward. Um, you know, I was the only one. Now you look up, not only in football, but in all sports, you have the Dak Prescott, the Naomi Osaka's, the Simone Biles, the Kevin Loves of the world standing mm -hmm. up saying, listen, this is what I deal with, and this is important. Now, Kate, what we have to do is get our guys to respond in that react. Like Calvin Ridley, I feel something. I can't play. I can't practice. You have uh, Naomi and Simone. Well, this is what's going on with me. I need time. Yes, there is a time and place for that, but also if we – have the proper things in place, we can probably work through these things. So we need to look at the athletes and sports as a microcosm to what we could be doing in other places, right? Like be proactive, take care of your mental health. It's important. It's the most important thing that you have. It's something you talked about. And I really think your authenticity always at a podium, after your career, during your career, you've always kept it real. And I think that's why players relate to you, even players that are like just coming into the game right now. And they're sitting down with you on I Am Athlete. And I just think it's really, really, really cool. And I loved your training camp tour. And my favorite was you and Joe Burrow, which was amazing. <laughs> Tell me what he's made of as a man, a leader. What did you learn? You know what? It's it's almost as if he's um, like he's not made up of much, and this is not a bad thing because he's super bright. Uh, he's a loving guy, but it's just like it's like still, like nothing rattles this kid. Like he's so amazing, and he's so calm, cool, collected. He's so humble. He's just like one way all the time, whether it's good, whether it's bad. That was my biggest takeaway, right? Like yeah. some guys walk in the room and they, the, the room may change them. He walks in the room and the room changes to whatever he's putting out. Joe Burrow and all those guys at that table really impressed me because they're superstars year one, year two. They find a way in the Super Bowl. They're playing, uh, uh, you know, lights out football but they still have this brotherhood. They still have this love and they still have this sense of humility, which a lot of guys lose when they get to this level and in, in, in just in their careers. So I was really impressed with Joe. Joe. Joe is going to be, you know, he's going to be a Hall of Famer. Damn, I, I said that. What is this year three for him? Yeah. I'm calling him a Hall of Famer. He started with an he's injury. That, he's, he's, yeah. He's that guy. Took his team to the Super Bowl. Got to take his team to the win column here in week two. Now, he does have Jamar Chase, who I think you met when you were out there, too. They have perfect chemistry, right? That carries over from college. A lot of these stud wide receivers moved this offseason. Which wide receiver do you think landed in the best situation? Obviously, A.J. Brown, Devontae, Tyreek. Who's, who's going to end up on top? A.J. Brown. Yeah. Oh, hey. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Fly, Eagles, fly. Did you see him in week one? When yes. did he go with 10, 10 catches, 155 yards? Crazy. I think it was. Crazy. I mean, you know, the last time we saw something like that was when Terrell Owens was in his prime, right? Like, think about, like, just how he looked. He had his freaking dark visor on, muscles popping out. And not only the mu muscles <laughs> popping out, but he had, like, oil coming down his body. Well, it was a night game. I mean, he was breaking tackles. He looked, yeah. Legendary. He... He is in the best position. Yeah. I love A.J. Brown. And right now I got Justin Jefferson, number one. I got A.J. Brown, Whoa! number two. And then I put Devontae Adams still there out of respect. But right now, Justin Jefferson is the best wide receiver in the league. And then Cooper number Cup. two is A.J. Brown, but it's close. Cooper Cup Cooper Twitter. Cup is top Cooper five. Cup Twitter's right here. Maybe, what, what? Maybe. what? Top what? <laughs> <laughs> top what? Justin Jefferson's what? Cooper Cup. Justin Jefferson's one. Cooper Cup here. Here's the deal with Cooper Cup, Go right? On. Like, um, Right now, he's top five. He's top five. Okay, cool. I, sure. <laughs> tell me what the thing is about Cooper like, Cup, Brandon. <laughs> well, so the guys, this is what the guys feel, right? Like, system, right? Like, first of all, he runs routes, you know, you know that no one else can run. He's consistent. His football IQ is through the roof, mm -hmm. right? But 
you know, he's getting a lot of targets and they're moving them all around. So a lot of guys, what they're saying out there, what they are saying, not me, this is just, just the you know, my ear to the street. What the guys are saying is, look, I want to see why receivers go to one side and it's mono y mono. Can you beat me play after play after play? That's what they want to see, right? And Stephon yeah. Diggs, you get that out of Stephon Diggs. You get that out of, you know, the Allens of the world, the Keenan Allens of the world. You get that out of Tyreek Hills of the world. So that's the debate around Cooper Cup. Can he do that if he just lines up two yards outside the numbers yeah. and go mono y mono with the best of the best? And where does he stack up? I'm not going to question you because you, you know, I don't think there's a wide receiver like you in the game. I, ra- I know, I know. But Why I'm are you questioning question me? You about- question the oh, other the guys. guys. The guys in the streets. The, the guys. guys that you got. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, but I was thinking about who compares to you, and it's sort of impossible to do. The body size, the speed, the toughness. Right. There's no you in today's game. You're very unique, right? So is there anyone in the league who does sort of mirror your game? Because to me, you're like if Mike Evans, A.J. Brown, and Mike Williams had a baby, that would be you. Wow, you took the words out of my mouth. That's really good. That's really good. Yes, um, it's AJ Brown and Mike Evans put them together. Yeah, AJ Brown and Mike Evans. I'm not as I'm not I'm not I wasn't as explosive as AJ Brown. You guys watch him. But toughness, he was so good. I'm telling you, the Eagle. That's the best addition. But I can't believe we have Devontae uh, Adams at three. All right, quickly, last one for you. I'm gonna ask you. Let me try to see. Oh, I want to ask you about you and Alshon. While we're, while we're just getting these hot takes out of you that'll be all over Twitter, you and Alshon <laughs> had this special season. I mean, you mentioned Eddie Royal, which I just love when you were out in Denver. But uh, 2013, 1,400 yards for Alshon. You had a smidge under 1,300 and 12 touchdowns. To me as a Bears fan, it was iconic. They pulled out a win in week yeah. one somehow. But is there a duo that you think is the best today? We know who you think the best wide receiver is. Is there a duo you like? Yeah, I still like Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson. Yeah, that's it. Uh, phenomenal there. Um, get, help me out here. Who else do we have out there? I love, I think Cincinnati, they're at re- receiver Well, court. Godwin's hurt, I love so. the makeup of the, yep. What about Godwin's Julio hurt, and Evans? So got Tampa. Yeah, but I wouldn't put them at number one right now. Like, um, I, and then also one to look out for. What? Gabe Davis and Stephon Diggs. Yeah, we yeah. know who Stephon Diggs is. Gabe Davis did you? Yeah, I know you watched him, but yeah. I, this is like my favorite thing to say right now on TV right now. Did you watch Gabe Davis <laughs> opening night? <laughs> they're yeah, number that, one. They, Buffalo, he had that, they're number one. Yeah, he had that last year. It's it sort of carried over from last year, Gabe Davis emerging. And they had, you know, Josh Allen just on another level. They might win the Super Bowl. I'd be happy to see it. Mm-hmm. I love it. Do you think so? Ooh. You got them in the Super Bowl? Hey, Chicago, no, no, everybody does. I don't know. I, I forgot. I don't even know if I picked a Super Bowl. Quickly, we talked Bears. They got the Packers Sunday night. Big game. You know that rivalry well. I'm not going to ask you about X's and O's. D- you know, I'm from there. D- do you have yeah. faith in the Chicago Bears organization to turn the fortunes of their team? No, I do not. I do not. I'm sorry. Um, I, I love the city of Chicago. Um, it was one of my favorite experiences. It's the best sports town in the whole wide world, right? Like I had to fight, you know, uh, the city of Chicago so I can pay for my own meals. They took care of me. They still showed me a lot of love. Mm. Um, awesome there. But management, it's not in a good place. And that's, it's just not. It's not. It's the Chicago Bears. This is the Chicago Bears. Mm-hmm. How have we been sitting here at the bottom of the NFL for this long? Shouldn't happen at all, at all. This is a premier team, right? This is the Chicago Bears. They should not be this bad for this long at all. I know. They're looking. They're a very angry fan base. They're looking for something to hold on to. They won over the in sloppy conditions over Trey Lance and the Niners, and it was as if they had won a Super Bowl. They were so excited about it. They're, those fans, I feel for them. They're looking for something to hold on to. Brandon Marshall, you are the absolute best. Takes on takes, as always. I am Athlete Podcast. Who's on next? Oh, we have Mikey coming out Monday. You know, okay. we, we went to that level. You know, talk a little bit of uh, name, image, likeness. Mikey, you know, little Mikey the basketball I'm guy. I'm sorry, are you joking? No, I'm being serious. He's coming on. How? What? Mikey's coming on. Yeah, we got Mikey coming out Monday. Conrad, what'd you say? <laughs> He's a hooper from Southern California, as he's telling me in my ear. Thanks, Conrad. Okay, Brandon Marshall, we appreciate you. We'll be back it's with more Thursday season. Night Football. Love you. You're the best. I'm so happy for your success. You, he's the best. All right. Mike Williams, one of the, th- the ingredients to make a Brandon Marshall. <laughs> the NFL had himself a date. Wasn't enough for the Chargers. We'll get to the Chiefs side of things. My takeaways are next. Oh, th-
Thursday night football kickoff to week two. It is my favorite rivalry. We needed a good rivalry in the NFL. This is one I'm sticking to year in, year out. Close games as always. And the Chiefs get a win at home. Uh, the night was all about the Watsons. Listen, I love a Watson I can cheer for. We're looking for one in the NFL. And we had two last night. Justin Watson, 41-yard receiving touchdown in the third quarter. That was his first catch as a Chief. You love to see it. And then what a moment with Jalen Watson. The play of the game, of course. You've seen it everywhere. This is a seventh-round rookie. You know, 99-yard pick six. What else can you say? Gerald Everett, not ready, gassed for this one. Who cares about any of that? This is what matters. It is this, and if you're wondering, that Watson, this Watson, yeah, congrats to the Chiefs on this, and not even the defensive play, which obviously was incredible, uh, and Herbert, testament to him playing through injury, but the depth of Kansas City is a winning formula. The depth of Kansas City is a winning formula. You heard what Dante Hall said, distribute the ball. You heard what Brandon Marshall said, don't force it, have a balanced offense. Two straight games now with nine players with one or more catches, okay? Spags, I said it before, deserves credit for getting that defense to step up. Al Michaels sort of uh, invoked number 95, Chris Jones, late in the game. He was a quiet, rumbling volcano for about three quarters. And then what does he do? Turns it up a notch just when he needed to, and they do that a lot. On the Chargers side, heroic effort from Herbert. Didn't love to see it. Maybe pull him out when you're down 10. Maybe protect him from the likes of Frank Clark out there when you're down. But then again, a warrior. And, and did Brandon Marshall say it goes a long way in the locker room? Kind of. He said that he, you know, if Brandon Marshall clowned on him for his win-loss record, and then after this gutsy performance in a loss, gained respect for him and started to think about him a different way, that's all you need to know. Brandon Marshall keeps it all the way real. That means that locker room. That means Keenan Allen in his rehab, who's obviously dealing with injuries since he got into the league after his rookie season. When you have injuries to, you know, or, or you're gassed when you're whatever, you're going to get up and try to run through a wall for Justin Herbert. He's going uh, through a battery of tests. That's all we know today. Sort of mum. Staley was asked about it, and he sort of said, oh, it was a tough game. He took a lot of hits. You know, he's our quarterback. Uh, and speaking of toughness, Conrad Company, not you. Oh. You're not. You're not. Oh. Tough. Okay. Right, uh, back with this background. Marissa McBride, you are in trouble. You were supposed to change the background. There it is. Okay. Yeah. You're a Wisconsin guy? No, is that what Wisconsin is playing? Who's, who's, who are they playing? This, this actually really hurts. This, this really hurts. Who's playing New Mexico? Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you're a fan of Wisconsin. You're from Ohio, but you talk like you're from Georgia. Like, I don't know anything about you. Okay. Okay, listen, but let's get into this. Yes. Derwin James, talk to me, because oh. you all morning have been barking about Derwin James. I mean, the, the entire world's been barking about Derwin James. Look at this guy. He got that dog in him, okay? He got that dog in him. I mean, how many guys do you know can pick up Travis Kelsey? and do a full suplex on a grown man like that. He's actually extremely lucky that J.C. Jackson touches him right there, because if not, that's straight on the back. Derwin James, yeah. Kenny Adams? Yeah. He got that dog in he him. He got that dog. Do we have the x-ray? I'm waiting. Oh, oh of course there you it do. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're so cool and hip on this oh, show. Oh, I love it. Uh, I love here's it. the thing, though. Derwin James all over the field last night didn't matter. Couldn't squeak out the win, so Conrad, I mean, they've got 10 days of rest, which is great, the benefit of all this, right? They've got the Jags. Maybe it's a get-right game. I don't think the Jags should be super competitive in this one. Uh, but the, it wasn't enough. So I don't, to, to a, to a, you know, I don't want to admit it, but Brandon Marshall's not wrong. Like, great, so exciting, well-rounded, Brandon Staley, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, like, you got to get wins. You have to. Well, I think everybody was surprised. The, the Brandon Staley we saw last year was so aggressive. I know. And last night, he yeah, was so he conservative. He went, for, he went for it, though. He just didn't go for it every time. No, he didn't. I mean, like, and that's, and that's just it. I mean, at the end yeah. of the game, they, they, they marched Herbert back out there. They got down the field. They got the last touchdown. But it was just a little bit too late. And you know what? Yeah. Everyone knows. I know, I know everyone knows. The pick six is what ended it. But that drive after, when uh, they got the ball back, yeah. they were just—they were gassed themselves. They, yeah. There was no way they were going down the field to score. Good luck to there. the New Mexico Aggies. Thank you for injecting mm. an X-ray with a dog inside of it. That makes a lot of sense here. This is Up and Adams. Now it's time to head out to our NFL reporters covering some of the biggest matchups this weekend. This guy covers the Baltimore Ravens for the Athletic. Please welcome in Jeff Zrebeck. How are you? Good. Good morning. Jeff, I think that's a—that's a Polish last name, no? Yes, that is. Very yeah, good. See, look, we're like Very family. Impressive. This is great. Uh, okay, the Ravens take on the Dolphins this week. Last season, the Ravens suffered a tough loss to those Dolphins, that Dolphins defense that looked pretty good in stifling the New England Patriots last week. Uh, what do you got on this one? What are you looking for? 
Yeah, to credit to the Ravens, they're not exactly running from that game. You know, they've been pretty upfront about how that game left, uh, you know, a serious mark on their season. Their offense, you know, injuries had a lot to do with it, but their offense really never recovered from there. They were never the same offensive team after that game. So uh, they understand they're going to have to be much better. They understand they're going to have to have a better plan uh, for the Miami blitz and the aggressiveness Miami shows. And they've had a long time to work on this. Uh, John Harbaugh admitted uh, this is something all off season they were looking at. So uh, they expect the result to be different uh, and, and it's a really big game for them to show that yeah you know Lamar Jackson of course betting on himself he bulked up a bit this offseason uh, has it changed the Ravens approach on offense no, I don't think so. Um, I, I think the good part of the week one was you saw him take several shots down the field and make several big plays. That was sort of how the game was going, and, and, and that's what they needed to do. And, uh, you know, that's always been the thing with the Ravens. Can they create enough big plays downfield to be a really dangerous offense in addition to the running game? But it is a different offensive team a little bit. You know, we haven't, you know, Lamar Jackson only ran the ball four times uh, last week, and, and only only two of them were called runs. I think that was more of a case. They kind of felt like they didn't need to yeah. last week. And this could be different, but they definitely need to get their run game going. Uh, they didn't run the ball well in the preseason, and they did not run the ball well last week. And uh, if they're going to be the offense they want to be, you know, they have to be able to have that consistent running game. Is the con? You know, I, I have you on, and, and I don't want to ask you about the contract thing because I know <laughs> it's shelved. But I have to ask you about the contract thing because it's crazy. Is it something that's looming still? You know, I didn't get any popcorn, so I apparently didn't ask Lamar Jackson the right questions the other day. Uh, unfortunately, I still quite, kind of haven't gotten over that. But you know what? The thing is interesting because he's sort of serving as his own agent in yeah. all this. It's not really a, it seems like the guys in the locker room are as curious as all the media and the fans about it. I mean, Lamar hasn't made it a big deal. He doesn't want to talk about it. He hasn't been talking about it with his teammates. Um, it's not going away let's be honest we'd be naive to think it's just going to suddenly right. go away every game Lamar plays this year is going to kind of serve as a referendum on his contract should yeah. he get paid more uh, should he have turned that deal down I, I think we all know that it's not going away but I don't think in terms of a day-to-day -day distraction I wouldn't say it's that Mark Ingram said, pay the man, pay the man, former Raven, and he loves him, and I, I, we all, of course, wish it was that easy, and, you know, he only ran four times on those four runs. I'm going, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, please stay healthy. <laughs> we don't need another Jack Prescott situation. Uh, quickly, I saw Marlon Humphrey, my favorite, on the injury report. Is it from tweeting too much? Does he have, like, carpal tunnel in his thumbs, or what's the story? Quickly. Yeah, I guess he tweaked his groin a little bit, oh, and oh. Uh, you know this is not a uh, this is not a good week where you want to have some question marks at corner, and, and the Ravens have that a little bit after losing uh, Kyle Fuller on yep. Sunday to ACL. Uh, the good news is Marcus Peters looks like he's getting back. Now, I'm not positive it's going to be Sunday, uh, but he's certainly getting closer. Uh, he was a full participant in practice uh, Thursday for the first time. Uh, you know, you don't want to lose anybody, but getting an All Pro like. Peter's back will be a huge development for this defense. But Sunday, they're going to have to figure it out because they're definitely a little bit shorthanded at cornerback. He's the Polish Dynamo covering the Ravens for the Athletic. Jeff Zarebeck, we appreciate you. Enjoy the game. I hope you get a win here as we flip things over to the Saints side of things. That's right, New Orleans beat writer for New Orleans Football. Oh, my gosh, we finally meet. This year, like my, <laughs> my Twitter friend for 10 years. How are you? Nick Underhill. Yeah, they, they they kind of put us together there because, uh, you know, you, you got your thing with the Saints. But, yeah, for sure, it's, it's cool to be on here. Thank you. Let's start with an injury report here. Of course, big game when the Saints, you know, do pretty well and against the Buccaneers. What do we need to know about Alvin? Yeah, I think it's probably like a 40-60 chance he plays. He has a little rib cartilage injury. Um, after the game, he, he thought he was fine. But it's a situation that's definitely worth monitoring at this point. He practiced on Wednesday, did not practice yesterday. We'll see today. I know they kind of ordered a, a little flak jacket type thing for him. So um, we'll see how that comes together. Uh, I talked to Ingram this week. Uh, let's just take a little listen to that. He talked about the receiver room. Talk to me about this wide receiver room because it went from zero to 100. Very fast. Real quick. Real, real quick. quick. Talk about Mike Thomas. Last time he played a full season was uh, offensive player of the year. Um, you got Chris Olave. Man, young, smooth, man. He, he's, he's cold. Then you got Juice Landry. I, I mean. Love him. I mean, that's just the name speaks for itself. He bring that juice. I got the J.U. Ice with me. You know what I mean? How's the group coming together? And, I mean, high praise from Mark Ingram, who's everyone's biggest hype man. And how is having Michael Thomas back? 
Yeah, look, it's a world of difference. Last year at this time, Chris Hogan was out there catching touchdown yeah. passes for them, and now they got three guys. Chris Olave has looked amazing. Mike Thomas looks like he's on his way back. He had the two uh, touchdowns, contested catches, and I think that just gives Jameis a lot of confidence knowing he can throw passes to guys that are going to actually catch him this year and make those tough plays. Last year, we didn't see a lot of tight window throws. And uh, Jarvis Landry, $3 million. Like, I don't know what a win's worth in the NFL, but – it's probably close to three million bucks, and he kind of delivered one last week. So he kind of looks like the biggest steal in the league to me right now. Yeah. Uh, does Dennis Allen feel comfortable when he's at the podium? The things that you're seeing, mannerisms, the way he's dealing with the media. How's it going? Yeah, he's been great. Look, I mean, the biggest thing is, is it's really kind of shocking that Sean's gone because it doesn't really feel like Sean's gone. The wow. culture feels really similar. Uh, things are maybe a little bit looser. Media side, we're allowed to walk places we weren't allowed to walk before, and that. But team wise. <laughs> Everything really kind of feels the same. And I think that was important. Like, they needed that continuity. This is a good team. They didn't need to blow it up. So hiring DA, I think, kind of preserves that. So guys like Mark and Cam and them aren't looking at it like, you know, what the hell is going on? Why are you blowing everything up? Like, yeah. we built this and it works. So I think that's been really important for them. And uh, so far, so good. And I think it's a testament to Sean Payton. It was effective. Yeah. It worked so long. And to have players buy in year in, year out to the same coach is not an easy thing. Uh, and he did it year in, year out. And he has a lot of respect for Dennis Allen. He told me, I asked him, you got this game against the Bucks. You're the Brady Whisperer. You can take care of business. Does Dennis Allen have the cheat code? And he said he certainly does, of course, being the former defensive coordinator. Uh, you know, the Saints, are they going to continue to give Tom Brady fits this weekend? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the, the more interesting stories in the league. They play them twice a year, and they solve them twice a year, and Brady figures out every defense. You know, the key to that is just really the disguise, moving the safeties around, linebackers dropping to different depths. And I think they can do that better this year with Tyron Matthew and Marcus May because before, Marcus Williams was a deep safety. So you looked at him, and you kind of knew, okay, he's going to be deep on most of these plays. These two guys can go anywhere. And even last week, we saw some of that uh, – Tyron playing on the line, one guy showing he's going down, one guy showing he's going deep, and then, you know, ready to snap, one of them declares. So if they can keep Brady's eyes moving around and yeah. get pressure with that front four, it could continue. At some point, it feels like Brady's got to figure it out, but it's uh, one of the crazier things going in the league right we'll now. We'll see how they handle Julio. We know how they handle Mike Evans. Marshall Latimer has had success <laughs> against him, of course. Uh, Tom has six touchdowns, just to get this out there. Six touchdowns to eight interceptions in those four losses to the Saints. Uh, I'll just leave that there and say have a good weekend covering those Saints against those Buccaneers. Nick Underhill, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We're not done. We've got more big guests coming up. How about Peter King? He'll stop by the show, and I'm going to drink a beer for his recommendation. Also, uh, yeah, in honor of a Chiefs win and the fact that Dante Hell was in studio with us, who or what do you think is the X factor for your team to get a win week two? You'll tweets on the airwaves next. What a wild TNF. Uh, our next guest, one of the most prolific and well-regarded NFL writers of all time, is Colin Football Morning in America is an absolute weekly must-read. Three-time National Sports Writer of the Year from NBC Sports, Peter King. How are you? Great to be with you, Kay. How are you? Good. Like you were saying in the break, long time no see. You and I used to be in those green rooms when I I didn't even have money for the train on the Metro North, and I would steal bags of popcorn in my bag so I had dinner. That was Those, those were those days. You were great at SI, and I'm so glad for your success. Congrats. Thank you, Peter. Let's get into it. Great game last night. Chargers, Chiefs, so many storylines. What popped out to you? Two things. One, I thought the uh, replay overturn of the interception by Asante Samuel Jr. was horse crap. Um, I didn't think there was enough evidence to overturn that. Number two, I also thought that uh, Justin Herbert, this is not any just garden variety. Oh, well, he's fine. He's just a little banged up. He'll be ready to go next week. I don't know if he'll be ready to go or not, but that did not look any garden variety injury. It looked mm. like he, he might have some ribs or rib cartilage thing. That was not the wind being, you know, uh, blown out of you. And then I think the other thing is, Right now, post Tyreek Hill, look at Patrick Mahomes. Seven touchdowns, no interceptions, six different receivers. Okay, I have a feeling that it's nothing that Patrick Mahomes will ever say or Andy Reid will ever say. Say it, Peter. But I do think they're saying to Tyreek Hill, hey, you know what? We weren't a one-man team last year. We'll be fine. 
Or if it was a one-man team, they were trying to force it to him too much, and now he has several options, and uh, depth, yep. depth will win them a championship. The, the, the AFC should be on notice. Uh, let's talk about your column. I saw that you wrote, um, I don't even, it's not even a column. It's like a masterpiece work of art. But you had <laughs> Kevin O'Connell as your coach of the week right off the bat after their win over the Packers. Why is he a good fit, and can it continue? Look, I sensed it when I visited their training camp. This team needed not a breath of fresh air. They needed, uh, you know, an oxygen tank of fresh air because they were tired of Mike Zimmer. And they bring in Kevin O'Connell. He is the ultimate teacher. He doesn't raise his voice. He's just a, he's, he's a communicator and he's a teacher. And you can see how much, uh, how, how easy it is now for Kirk Cousins mm -hmm. to basically work within the confines of this offense. He loves the offense, and I think this is going to be a really interesting season for this offense particularly because you saw everybody knows that Justin Jefferson is getting the ball. Why was he right. open all the time? Right. That is Kevin O'Connell. And that'll be every defense scratching their heads and every fan at home saying that week in, week out. And it doesn't hurt that he has toys like Adam Thielen uh, and Dalvin Cook to play with as well. Now, you're in New York City. I'm here in L.A. Uh, and I want to go back because I want to root for the Giants. I lived there for 10 years and couldn't root for the Giants. Dable makes his debut. Are times a change in New York City? You know, I think Brian Dable did something that he needed to do. He needed to basically tell his team, hey, listen, I'm going to show my faith in you. And as long as you guys continue to reaffirm that faith, we're good. And so he chose to go for it uh, on a two point conversion and hand the ball to uh, shovel the ball to uh, Saquon Barkley. What was really interesting about this K is that he allowed uh, Mike Kafka, his offensive coordinator who brought that play from Kansas City, he allowed Kafka to make that decision on that last play. And Brian Dable is an offensive coach, but he believes that if you give the assignment as a play caller to your offensive coordinator, you can't take it away on the biggest play of the game. So his coaching staff loves that and his players love it. Credit to him also. I'm sure it, I'm, the New York Giants fans love seeing Daniel Jones get a little grief on the sideline from his new head coach. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you about what the appointment reading every week for football fans. It is so incredible, but it must be like a, it's just a Goliath, a monstrous undertaking. If you could, give us a look into the process. How do you attack that thing every week? You know, basically, I take Tuesday and Wednesday and I don't do a damn thing other than my podcast. Okay. And then I wake up Thursday morning and I start thinking about what's interesting about this week. And then I sit down and start writing a bunch of the flotsam and jetsam on Friday morning. And then uh, I, I write a lot before. You can't write an 11,000 word column Cannot. in one day. Yeah. And so there's a lot of stuff that is done by noon on Sunday, Eastern time, probably 5,000 words every week. And then it is just a sprint to the finish line. I try to finish about 2.30 or three o'clock in the morning. And the one other thing, Kay, I'm really fortunate because covering the league for 39 years, you build some relationships. So if I text somebody on Sunday and say, hey, I really need you. I'll usually get a phone call right. from that person. And so I don't know everybody, but I know a lot of people. And that's basically how you're able to get people on the phone right. after games and to be able to interpret and, and to try to dive deep into what exactly happened. 39 years. Sunday. Let's toast to that because in your column, you uh, in Football Morning in America, you talk about beer nerdness. I have a bartender here. Am I going with the morning Peroni or am I going with the Allagash White, my friend? Oh, my God. Okay, wait a second. It's 11.44 a.m. as we're recording this. Go on. Eastern time. Go on. That's 8.44 where you are. How can you have a beer right now? Who sings the It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere song? Kenny Chesney? Who yeah, is that? Yeah, somebody right, does. Right, somebody you does. You got to take the Allagash. Listen, Allagash, take the Allagash. This, is, this is in my fridge. This is a good summer beer. We're moving it to fall. I might need another recommendation, but it is beer nerdness. Uh, and and uh, we appreciate you. And cheers to you this morning. Peter King from NBC Sports. Read the column every week. It makes you smarter.
Porter. And thank you for all your work. 39 years toasting to you, my friend Peter King. And we'll be back on Up and Adams. Mm, mm -hmm. DF, yes! Play these guys. Trey Lance, good price tag, rough week one, but he bounces back. Guys, he averages 13 carries a game over his three career starts. Please play him. Jamal Williams, yeah, the undershift is amazing, but Jamal is still a thing. He was also the Lions' red zone back. Two touchdowns, play him. And Tyler Higby, $5,300 on FanDuel. Clearly a chemistry that he has with Matthew Stafford. Uh, he looked his way 11 times Thursday night. He caught five for 38. But listen, that kind of volume, you like it. DF, yes. Yes. Yesterday on the show, we had the tremendous Dante Hall. And we just love a studio guest. If you're in LA, you're a player, you're an analyst, you're a fan, just come to the studio and hang out with us. Um, he was one of the best return specialists, of course, in history. And in honor of that, let's, okay, what are we doing here? We're still looking at DFES. What do we got? Bye. One of the baddest return specialists in the history of the game. You still got it, Sean? You still got it. That's easy. There, I got this one. I can do mine sitting down. Tyreek Hill is gone. Ty who? I'm kidding. That's my boy. I'm kidding. That's my boy. What's the shirt you wear? Do you wear this to the con? Well, this is what I um found last year during the playoffs. Bury me at Arrowhead and I will cheer from the grave. Well, that's morbid, but I like it. I like it. He was so much fun. I loved it. He's Chiefs one, producer Conrad. I'm drunk. I was supposed to lay out for that sound, and I'm just talking like, what's going on next? <laughs> talk to me. Let's talk X Factors in honor of Dante Hall's appearance on our show. What do you got? X Factor. You know what, okay, Kayla? Let's blaze through some of these games, let's and you're going to give me the going. X Factor. Yeah, let's get some music in here. All right. Up first, Kay, we're going to have Falcons Rams. Falcons Rams, give me your X Factor. I'm going to go Allen Robinson. What was that? What was that? Just one catch for 12 yards last week on two targets. The Rams need him if they're going to get back on track. It cannot just be all Cooper Cup. Brandon Marshall doesn't even think Cooper Cup's a good receiver. What's going on here? So it just feels like this should be a time to get him involved. Go. Patriots Steelers, let's get to it. Uh, I'm going to go with the Alabama boys in this one. The Harris boys, not related, but Najee dealing with whatever's going on with his live. Franck left the game, says he's playing. Okay. And Damian Harris on the other side. These are two running backs that need to help their quarterbacks coming off bad weeks and slow starts in week one. Harris boys, Bama boys, get it done. Love it. Last but not least, Texans at Broncos. Well, we know. <laughs> We know Jerry Judy went off. We love a Jerry oh, yeah. Judy. We love him a lot. So we're going to go with Cortland Sutton, the other guy. Ooh. We call Jerry. Cortland needs to get involved. Let me, let me tell you, one yard fumble within the, what, what could maybe help that? I don't know, a big tight end goal target guy? A red zone. Wow, am I drunk after two sips of beer? Potentially, because I didn't eat breakfast, maybe. Uh, but he, he's the guy, right? He had four catches for 72 yards, as I see. They need to start featuring him more in the red zone, and maybe those fumble ruski issues go away. Absolutely. Now we got to go to break. Jeff Schwartz up next on the other side. <laughs> Just take it away. Good Let's job. Go. All right, we got to go here. Alex Highsmith for the Steelers is the X Factor without TJ. He's got to step up. Okay, him and Minko, we got to get it done. We'll be back. NFL veteran and current gambling analyst at Fox Sports, Jeff Schwartz. You are here for a bit of a fire drill, two-minute warning in our yes. show. Let's go looking at some of the matchups that you like. Seahawks at Niners, go. I'm the Macro Machines yes. man. Let's go Niners here. I think there's an overreaction to their loss and the Seahawks win. Guys, Geno Smith uh, was, uh, what, 6 of 10 for 31 yards in the second half um, of that game on, on, on m m Monday night. Niners are desperate here for a win. They're just a better team overall. Um, I think they get one here and get one in a big way. Okay, just so they're going to start one and one, though. Panthers and, and Giants. I know, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. Giants, points. Panthers, go. Um, again, another kind of overreaction to, to week one, right? I mean, Carolina played well in the second half of this game, made a, a furious comeback against the Browns, just wasn't enough. They lost on a 59-yard field goal where the Giants kind of made a furious comeback on the other side and beat the Titans in a game they really had no business. I think the Panthers are the better team right now. They have the better quarterback as well, the better defense. I'll take the Panthers on the road. Daniel Jones, by the way, awful, awful at MetLife Stadium in his career. Uh, awful in his career. The Giants looking for the first two in those start, though, since 2016. I'm loving my life. I just want everyone to know. <laughs> Bengals, Cowboys, talk to me. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with the big public play here and go with the Bengals, guys. Uh, obviously, we saw last weekend, minus five in turnovers, almost had a chance to win this game. They're going to bounce back in a big way. The Cowboys are a mess. Even before Dak Prescott got hurt, they weren't playing very well. Now McCarthy's blaming Kellen Moore for the offense. I'm going to take more of a role in this. 
I think the Bengals go in there. As I mentioned the other day, Kay, I feel like the preseason, no yeah. preseason did not help them. They'll play better in game in game two. I know it's public, whatever. I'll take the Bengals here in a big way. Yeah, that offensive line needs to gel. Bengals looking for their first win in Dallas since 1988. Unbelievable. Bears and Packers. Old rivalry, what do you got? Yeah, this one's easy, right? The Packers. Last season, they lost 38-3 to in week one. We all panicked. We thought they weren't going to do well. They came in the next weekend and blew out their opponent. The Packers are going to be fine, guys. Their offensive linemen are back practicing. Look, if Watson doesn't drop that pass on the first drive of the game, this game is totally different, right? I think we agree on that. The Bears, again, we cannot overreact to week one, okay? They won a game in the rain where the Niners outplayed them. Some turnovers issues. I'll take the Packers here in a big way at home against the Bears. Packers have won six straight over Chicago. Dolphins at Ravens. To wrap it up, look, we fit them all in. Cheers. Yes, we got it. Yes. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to Ravens here. I don't like the three and a half. It hopefully gets to three uh, by kickoff on Sunday. Baltimore slow the first half, played much better second half uh, of the game against the Jets. And I just don't trust kind of the Dolphins offense still. Um, I know the pieces are there. Don't trust, you know, don't trust the quarterback that much quite yet. And they run a bunch of zero pressure against in the weeds here a little bit. I think Baltimore can take advantage of that with Lamar Jackson, the playmakers they have on the edge. I think Baltimore wins this game, obviously covers this game. I'll take the Ravens. Yeah, I'm, I, the Dolphins defense, something I believe in a little bit in la this matchup last year. They totally took care of business and stifled Lamar and company. So, so this defense has to show me that they're the real deal, and so does that offense for the Ravens. Uh, we had Jeb Zreback, who covers them for the Athletic, tell us they need to get the run game going, which is something yeah. you don't think you ever have to tell and warn this Baltimore offense to do. Uh, the Dolphins Dolphins have not won in Baltimore, by the way, since 1997, the first ever game played between those two squads. We made it. Cheers to you, Jeff Swift. Sports are, oh, oh, are gambling out oh, at Fox Sports. Like, well, I can't, I, this should be every Friday. Conrad, can this be every Friday? It can be, Kay. It can be, you know, we, yeah, we actually got a great tweet, too. Let's take this tweet. Can we pull this up real quick before we get out of here? Yeah, drinking yeah. a beer. Do you like how Peter King's like, you can't do that? And I said, I do what I want! <laughs> All right, thank you to Brandon Marshall, Jeff Zreback, Nick Underhill, and Jeff Schwartz. We'll see you on Monday.